Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, where two busy dads get games to the table by any means necessary. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Every Night is Game Night, episode 148, Tiny Towns, Legends Untold, and a personal chat with Jambalaya Plays Games. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, this week, we have a very special episode. Uh, we usually have two of these, uh, two people, Liz and Jeremy, joining me for the uh, Kickstarter segments to talk about a lot, a lot of games. Uh, this week, though, for this very special episode, we have half of the crew, but we are going to try to match our fun and our enthusiasm whenever we get together. So I have Mr. Jeremy Howard from Jambalaya Plays Games back on the show. Welcome back, Jeremy. Hey, party people. This is Jeremy, Jambalaya Plays Games. I hate to refer to myself as an advertising brand, but hey, that's who I am. Oh, you're Jeremy. a brand, dude. You're a man versus meeple. If you saw <laughs> Jeremy's, um, his Twitter and his, uh, his Facebook and his post. We're recording just after Origins. It's going to be a little bit later than that when we release the episode. But if you saw his Origins coverage, I mean, you're just a huckster. <laughs> hey man, I, I I I live for this. I love. I do love it. I love the hobby. I love the people. But man, whoo, I almost died. I may have died by the time this is recorded. Um, <laughs> if you actually hear this, because I'm going to be at uh, Gen Con, probably infecting myself with another. A scary virus strain. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I do it for the people, man. I swear to you, I really do it because I love the hobby. I love the people. So, don't be a stranger, man. I just, I just, man. <laughs> yeah, that you, put me down. I had never had it before. It really put me down. I never, man. That that hurt. It hurt. Oh, you got um, you know, you got some fans out there. Every time we, uh, actually, it's pretty cool to see. Like whenever you and Liz pop on a show. Uh, we get a little bit of a number spike because you know you have your huge following over there, and Liz is sharing out with her followers, and people just really love the vibe. So you know, happy to um, you know kind of recreate it here. However, we're going to take a little bit of a left turn in the second half of this episode. Uh, so in the second half of this episode, I'm going to follow up on a show that I did about a month or two ago, where I talked a little bit about my personal journey. I talked about my depression. I talked about my mental health struggles. Um, you know, got a little bit, you know, real, <laughs> so to speak. But I tried to give kind of a hopeful message to people that, you know, people struggle through this and, um, you know, that, that you're not alone, you know. So I wanted to kind of put myself out there. I was really heartened to hear from a lot of folks, you know, with do private message and, you know, uh, on the geek list and all that kind of stuff saying, you know, thank you for sharing. Thank you for, you know, putting stuff out there. And I'm going through the same thing. I'm going through similar stuff. So... I kind of like realize the power of being able to do that to share um, and help people kind of resonate and get through some of their own personal stuff. So I was talking with Jeremy about it, just kind of on a private Slack and everything. And Jeremy, Jeremy goes through stuff too. Um, he's a big happy guy. <laughs> he's a big loving guy. He's a big, you know, uh, he's a big <laughs> teddy bear. When you meet him, and, and I, when by big I mean big. Th- this man. He's he's looking down at Tom Vassell. <laughs> I swear to goodness. <laughs> but there's a heart of gold in there, and there's also a personal journey in there as well. So uh, so we're going to share about that in the second half of the episode. You ready for that, my friend? Yeah, man. I'm so so ready, man. I I look forward to this. I look forward to coming on here, anyways, man. So thank you for having me. All right. So um, before we do that, uh, Jeremy has a story of a Kickstarter that we are going to preview. Um, he actually got a chance to meet with the designer uh, and, and get a preview of the game. There's actually a preview on one of his channels and everything. He's going to tell you about a Kickstarter that is live right now. Um, this is the Isle of Cats. So you want to tell me about a little bit about that one? Um, so not to go into so much depth, but it is basically uh, it's by Frank West. And he uh, has uh, City of Kings, which is his big one. And he had another game called Valorian Guardians, Gardens. And, um, you know, this game is a little, uh, quite a departure from I, both. Um, it is actually a game for, it's a tile, basically a tile placement game. Uh, it's got a little bit of everything in it, but it's got some Feast for Odin in it. It's got some, uh, like, kind of drafting things in it. And uh, it's 
the reason why I'm saying Feast for Odin is because it has a, a th- like a board that a boat kind of thing where you place tiles on it and you kind of trigger combos on how you cover up that area, but you also have to cover the negative points, which is part of Feast for Odin. Except you don't score like trigger bonuses for enclosing. I mean, enclosing things. You actually have to cover things up to score the bonuses. It's pretty cool um, and an interesting puzzle to play. And it has a high player count. It has a family mode, and it also has a solo mode. And I was just really impressed with this game. Uh, he just happened to pop up at Origins, and uh, I, I really am not doing the game any great justice. But you can see the uh, you can see it's live on Kickstarter right now. Um, and this is this is being recorded on June 25th, so you're going to see. You know, hopefully, you get a chance to take a look at it um, before the campaign closes. I'm sure I have a pledge manager too, um, but I think this is by far his best design. Um, you definitely want to take a look at it because it's got some interesting twists to it, and it is not light, but it can be lightened which is what I liked about it the most. And, of course, the solitaire is on point. And I filmed two videos of that. So you can see it on the BGG page, or you can go to the Jambalaya page, get, uh, Plays Games YouTube page to see it as well. That is Alec Cast. That is Frank West. He is a dear, dear person. We got to hang out with him at PAX Unplugged. Uh, you making me jealous over there, hanging out with him at Origins. Uh, yeah. So I'm rooting for him. You know, I want to see uh, all of his projects succeed. So thank you very much for sharing. Uh, very, very cool, man. So let us get to some game reviews upon that. Um, I'm actually texting Liz right now, letting her know that she you ninja her Isle of Cats uh, preview. She's like, you better. <laughs> uh, Oops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it has to be talked about, right? Yeah, it has to be talked about. All right. Let's make it happen. So speaking of games that we're going to talk about right now, we got two for you. Uh, one, you know, pretty popular family weight game. The other one uh, in the adventure space. So very, very different games. Very different games. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but the first thing, first one we're going to talk about is Tiny Towns. Tiny Towns is designed by Peter McPherson and published by AEG. Uh, AEG made the decision a little while ago to scale back on the number of games they publish uh, and kind of focus on a couple of games that they feel like will get big market penetration uh, and they are putting a pretty decent-sized bet that Tiny Towns is going to be one of their games. Okay, so it is a family weight, very, very lightweight. Um, let me with some strategy, but you know we're not you're not uh, brain burning yourself here. So it's an abstract city building game, and by city, I'm city building. I'm putting that in scare quotes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of city building that goes on in this game. It's just kind of a sheen yeah. uh, to kind of deliver the experience. Uh, it's for one to six players, and you start off with a four by four empty grid uh, in front of you, you're kind of in a player mat. And over the course of the game, you're going to fill that grid uh, first with cubes, and then by combining those cubes into buildings. Uh, so that's kind of the basic rhythm of the game. So on your turn, and I have a, I had a lot of fun with this. <laughs> uh, you, you're not really supposed to do it this way, but I, I recently taught the game for Dex Envoy, and I was just, I was just like goofing on some of the people that were at my table. So. <laughs> So what you do on your what you do on your turn is the the first player has this hammer piece, a little like kind of meeple hammer thing, and I had I had each person hold their hammer up in the air and say, "I declare that the board should have wood." <laughs> oh, God. and people are looking at looking at people like I had other people in the game store going, "What is happening over there? Why are people declaring every single like five seconds?" What's happening is that that first player is going to declare for a resource and every single person at the table, whether you're two players, four players or six players, is going to grab that resource, whether it's wood or glass or stone or something like that, and put that on one of your squares. So eventually what you're going to try to do as that hammer of destiny kind of gets passed around the board is you're going to try to make patterns and the patterns correspond to... uh, buildings or quote-unquote buildings so like if you put together an l shape the l shape makes a certain building and you put that in your mat or you might go ambitious and make like you know a big five six seven you know a brick pattern or you might make a bunch of little buildings you really kind of you know it's a very abstract puzzling experience and you're trying to position your cubes in a way where you're trying to maximize the number of buildings you can get onto your mat so Eventually, you're going to have a little city, and the city's going to give you little powers. It's going to score your points, and you just kind of go back and forth uh, that way. So for the most part, for the most part in the game, it's kind of a multiplayer solitaire experience. 
So the solid, the actual solitaire is not that different. It's just a bot that kind of does that I declare announcement voice. You know, kind of, you know, you pull cards and you kind of check out what you get. When, and this is the part that I think Jeremy's going to be t- talking about a little bit. At the end game, and especially at higher players, then it gets a little bit interactive. Where when you declare for a resource, you might... Instead of just looking at your board, look at other people's boards and say, oh, they might need glass. No way I'm declaring for glass. Oh, uh, if they get stoned, they're stuck and they're going to have to end their turn. And so if you're stuck, you just, you're, you're out and you score your, you score your mat. Um, so there's a little bit of interaction there. But for the most part, you're putting together the puzzle, putting together this kind of Tetris-like system on your board. You're putting together powers. It's just, you know, it's a very smooth kind of abstract experience. So, Jeremy, uh, I think I stole your thunder a little bit, but I know you had more to say about that kind of interactive piece. Yeah, so I think the the really big flaw to this game, if there is a flaw you want to really find out, like, hey, what, what makes this game not so, you know, like, we, we're going to say some good things, but it's like, what's what's the, the crux here? Okay, so higher player count, you know, like, if you think of abstract games, you definitely want to pay attention to player count, because a lot of them are two-player games. And, uh, you know, as you get to that two to four more randomness, more cutthroat. Well, as you get to, let's say you get to four, and then four to six, you got to realize, of course, since every every person not you is calling out a color, they're doing things in their best interest. Okay, so um, that's going to lead to eventually, you know, maybe having someone, even if they have a good engine, because some buildings help you build an engine or you get pieces on off turns, um, they're going to eventually start saying, hey, like, this person's kind of front-running. I'll just hold off on calling for yellow cubes for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or I'll just not call Brown again and wait for somebody else to call Brown. And, you know, there's that strategy, but it's also, especially for new players, they're going to get crushed. And then there's also many games where people who are even good just kind of get the luck of someone not picking what they want, which is part of the game. Um, and I just I just want people to know that because you could feel left out. Mm-hmm. And that's a bummer, but it, that's what it, the mechanic is built around. But they also have a deck where you can basically take a couple turns and then use the deck and, and turn over one card, so at least there's a little bit of extra randomness where you don't feel like, hey, you know, they're only doing this to kind of stop me, and you have a deck. Or you can just do all that deck that has the different uh, different types of materials in it and just play it from there. It's, it's however you really want to do it, honestly. They kind of have suggestion ones, but you can really make the game custom to how you really want it to work for you. Um, because it's a really well designed game. I think this um, game is excellently designed. Like it's it's yeah. a, and it really came through as a teacher because I you know taught it for the splash and everything. It yeah. it it basically once you get a table to learn the game, it was one of the very few games where I could just literally leave the table and everybody was fine. Like normally when you do these splashes, you're kind of like there and answering a bunch of questions. It's like, okay, this is this and this and this. With this game, it was like, okay, I taught it, took five minutes or whatever it is, and then boom, just just go. And that takes design. It doesn't just happen. Like it, you have to like right. edit and edit and edit and smooth and polish. Like I really did feel like they just took the game and, and narrowed it down to the very, very core essence of what it had to be, which is this the the puzzly experience but also you know that can handle a kind of bigger load of player count and everything and gave you the core of what it's trying to go for no frills no must no fuss just go for it yeah i i'll be honest with you like this is you know like when they come up with like this the most generic say like it's quick simple fun like this is actually what it is but it, uh the cool part is is that it's like it is like your own personal solitaire in the way you want it you know like it's multiplayer solitaire the way you want it like you want your own little puzzle over there um, and it's also like the own little puzzle multiplayer solitaire that's not Euro. Like it's Mike. Hey, like I get to figure out my own little thing. It's not overly complicated rules. It helps that it has replay value, so you're not gonna play the same game every time. One thing that we mentioned is there's seven. I think there's seven different types of buildings, and each one of them has four different ways they score. So you can have four four of each type. So you can have lit, you can have pretty much after you do the the base setup, you can kind of just shake it up and try different stuff. Plus, they have monuments, which is another thing you can have in or not, that create special scoring conditions for in-game or during the game. They give you power. So there's a lot of replay value in this game. Um, it does not hide the fun. Like, it's fun all the time. Um, uh, and I forgot to mention this. I met this, this I met the designer at PAX U, 
And I remember him telling a story, and I don't want to like completely you know, butcher it and make it make it a fairy tale here. But <laughs> I, I remember, I think his grandfather or his father, what he got this some of this idea from his grandfather or his father. His father, his grandfather and father made a game with a five by five thing, and it like inspired him to make this game. So I, I thought that was really kind of cool. I remember him kind of explaining it to me, um, and that's what really got me excited about it because I'm really about like people, people and the process kind of thing. Right. And uh, yeah, it just that really hit me, and I got to play it right away, which is really fun. And uh, yeah, I think this game just has. The thing, I think the thing is, is that I think this game has staying power. Um, you know, I haven't played it in a while, but like I'm ready to whip this out at any time. And like this is like I got my son's birthday party coming up. It's perfect. He's seven. I mean, I played this with people. I played it with aunts and uncles. Like, it works. It just works. Because mm-hmm. it's easy to learn. So here's, you know? I, I agree with you. And, I, and what I said about being well-designed is, is absolutely true. And, you know, I am. I can give a gate, this game, a good recommendation. I had a good time teaching it. All stuff is true. My one thing is that I felt the same exact way about Splendor in 2012 where I thought I was going to play that game forever. It's like so simple and yeah. you know I, I it, it's very easy to teach and all and and whatever and now you could not pay me to play another game of Splendor. Well, you know it is well, <laughs> well uh you know you know what that is though? I mean if we're, if we're being honest like that's just game involved game uh games involving like you know what? I've never played Splendor. But I've played games that represent splendor so much and at a better way i've actually seen tutorials on splendor i like had to watch like i was like okay at least i know what this is oh i've played this game before it's this it's that it's this right. it's that and they all do splendor better but you know what it had to exist first splendor, splendor. you know yeah. so it's like i understand why they even keep explaining it to this day and i'm sure the game is better than it was then but i have king's guild that's better than splendor i have you know century spice road better than splendor i have um, what is that? Uh, Majesty for the Realm. Like games right. that are like it, they just do it better. Time has moved on. That's fine. But for Tiny Towns, there's you know there's games that have the same kind of concepts and stuff, but like not really. You know, like this game can be expanded like crazy, and that's all some people will need. And I'll keep this box, and as long as I know a game that's going to last me for more than a year at this point, it gets to stay. And I'm going to keep you know saying, hey, this game is great. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, gonna, I, I guess I'm, I think I'm wondering I think it's memorable. I, I'm wondering how much a game that has literally zero theme like there's nothing to get attached to it's only mechanisms and I know right. there's some people that love that and I, I definitely want to put it out there that like if you're a person that loves just only mechanisms and it's smooth and it's fun then you might actually have a good time with this but I like I that messed me up. Like there is zero. Like they could, this this could have been anything. You, you and know I what need the- and, and I guess as a and and maybe I'm attached city building. Like oh it's a city builder. Oh it's not a city builder. So that disappointed right. me. But like I, am I going like am I gonna have the same feeling that I did with Splendor where it's like you know I enjoy it but then it kind of feels like empty ca- empty calories after the multiple plays even with all the cars like you said before different buildings and everything. Right. Am I gonna come back to this in a year? That question that you ask. Oh, you know, I don't know. That, that, uh, okay, well, I, I totally agree with that. And it definitely depends on, like, how much you even, like, say this is a theme or not. You know, like, that's the same thing. Like, okay, so, yeah, you get buildings that look like buildings in a town, and you make your town, but you don't name it. You don't have any, like, uh, you know, like, these tiles are, are grass tiles that need to have X on them. You don't have those types of things. But the game has the potential to have that eventually. Or it could just stay where it's at and add some cards every once in a while, or not at all, and just be what it is. And yeah. I kind of think of, like, let's go backwards then. Like, let's go backwards. It's called Tiny Towns, whether you feel the theme hits or not, and let's strip that away and just say, ooh, this is like a Polynomials game. Okay, let's strip that away. And let's make it a game that's just as simple as any of the other abstracts in the world that are just made of wooden pieces. And I think of, like, let's just say, like, a game like Quarto one of the best games ever you know what nobody talks about portal you know like yeah <laughs> it's, but it but it sells out it, it's in every game store for a reason and it's not junk sure. it sells like crazy you know pylos sells like crazy it's 
that that's where we are in a time we're in a time where you know like we want shiny box we want game, good gameplay but we really do want a shiny box because it's attractive and we also want shiny things when we open it because it's attractive we want people to come sit down and play with us but like for me it still will always be the core of like gameplay over everything and like this game has that i just hope right that this game and, and i believe it will that's why i want it i'm keeping it and i really advocate for it like i hope that it does have that long game and i hope they come back to it because that's the thing it's how well did it sell for people to come back to it and that may even make me even more, more of like a champion for this game um yeah. so i'm, I'm kind of like kind of like you know defending it with the the thought of like I see a long game here, and I just mm-hmm. hope AEG sees that long game too, because there is some potential to even add that more gamery stuff. But even to me, as an abstract as I see it, it's still very, very, very good. Yeah, and to be clear, it doesn't play like Smunder. It's a different game, but it's just uh, just being the point about the abstractness of it. Uh, right, but right. Yeah, I mean, I like if you like that kind of game, like you know, the reviewers always say that you know if you like this, <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. Uh-huh. Uh, but at the same time, you know, just want to make clear about you know what you're getting into. Uh, this is not a city builder, but it is a kind of slick little abstract game that you might enjoy. So uh, that is Tiny Towns uh, from AEG, and now we are going to get to a very different game uh, where. <laughs> Where Tiny Towns, I, I almost like had fun putting these two together because they're so opposite. Um, they're so, so, t- <laughs> so opposite. So if Tiny Towns was like an abstract, you know, very quick experience, um, this next game does not, it wants to be deep. And it wants to be a, an immersive, fun experience. So this is Legends Untold. So Legends Untold was designed by Hugh Decker and Kevin Young, published by Inspiring Games. So this is a adventure card game. Hey, adventure card game. I there's oh. tons of those. <laughs> oh. How many of those? I feel like we hear about those either on Kickstarter or landing or something every single month. Um, but there's a lot of them, and so many. In fact, uh, Kevin Young, the designer, tells a story of how a publisher kind of looked at it at its earliest iterations because this game's been around for a long, long time, and says, "Hey, this game's a lot like Pathfinder adventure card game. Why not just why don't I just play that? You know." <laughs> Uh, mm. And it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's like, okay, how does this game differentiate itself from games like Pathfinder and all all the other adventure card games? So a couple of things. So you, I mean, you know what the adventure card game shtick is. Like you, you know, you you have it's all decks of cards. There's no like a separate pieces or anything like that. There's no minis or anything like that. Um, but what this game does in terms of mixing up that formula is that. Well, a couple things. First, your character. Your character isn't a deck like in Pathfinder. It's just a it's a set of cards, and the cards have your powers on them, and they're modular, so you can kind of swap in, in and out powers. So, you know, there's a little bit of a difference there. What really separates this game is the map. So the map the map's a series of cards, and depending on where you're going, you know, so there's lots of different ways of setting up that kind of map deck. You're going to try to explore. It, it, this game probably hits the exploration button a lot harder than a lot of adventure card games. A lot of adventure card games, they emphasize different things. So like, you know, um, here's a turn off, emphasizes combat, you know, and lots and lots of it. Uh, Pathfinder, you're kind of on this hunt. So you set up these decks and you have to hunt each deck to find the bad guy. Here you're exploring, you're going deeper into the cavern. You're, um, every time you, ex- you, you turn over a card and you interpret the symbols on the card, you know, you find out that, oh my God, there's a, uh, you draw random encounters, and you might get a fight. You might get a a totally random thing that happens, and you have to like you know kind of roll skill checks to get through it. It's trying to give that thrust of an of a anything can happen exploration adventure that unfolds one card by one card by one card as you move through the thing. Um, so in terms of a feeling, that's exactly what you're getting here. Um, in terms of actually well- operationalizing it. It's an old school, like, kind of spirit of a game. So you're going to get some dice. <laughs> dicey, dicey, dice. <laughs> this I mean, game dice. is, this I mean, game is dicey. D6, dicey, dicey. 3D6, 2D6. <laughs> Rule check, spot check. Check, 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 check. Check, check. Is this mic on? Is this check, mic check, on? Check, 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 check. <laughs> Microphone check, one, two, one, yeah. two. <laughs> okay. 
It is a lot of skill checks, my friends. It is 3D6 in order to basically do anything in this game. And we'll get into how that plays out in a second, but we can't kind of avoid that is in order to kind of do, you know, progress along the combat, you know, there's a system of rolling dice and then progress along exploration cards and progress along uh, even to just reveal, you know, another card, you know, you have to make a 3D6 check in order to, you know, see if you're surprised or see what kind of your state in terms of moving through the cards, but that you're, you know, it's an old school kind of feel. So you're going to be rolling those those CD three six a lot. Um, you're going for scenarios, and there's very different scenarios. There's a lot of different sets. Um, we've played both of the opening sets, the Weeping Caves, and uh, I think it was the Sewers or something like that. I forget exactly what the yeah. Sewers are called. Yeah, okay, Sewers. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so then, you know, and you have an ongoing campaign that you can set up. So there's a lot of kind of replayability there. You can combine the sets. Uh, the please don't do that willy nilly because you might get some weird combinations, but you can kind of, you know, flavor up the base deck with, you know, certain cards, certain encounters from different sets. So really that's kind of what you're doing in terms of a, a base experience. So Jeremy has a little bit more to say in terms of like the background of the game is because the game has a little bit of an interesting story in terms of how it landed uh, in its, in, into its present form. You want to share that a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to take like a total negative route, but I will tell you kind of like my story of what this game was and, uh, and how it came to be. And uh, it is a really good turnaround story in a sense. Um, but this is one of the first games I, I, I kickstarted um, a ways back, and I believe it was in 2017-ish, something like that. Um, it was a ways back, and um, actually, I would say 2016. Um, but yeah, it, it was a long time ago, and I pledged for it. I saw <laughs> ancient that, history, ancient. <laughs> yeah, and it was really because it's. I know it's ancient history. Like <laughs> that was ye old yesteryear <laughs> um, <laughs> when Barack Obama was president. <laughs> right when Barack was in office. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> my head around some of the ridiculous things I was about to say. Um, so this game, yeah, it has a past. It took a long time to, to you know, um, to get here. And right away, of course, if I say 2000, it was estimated to ship, I think it was supposed to be here in June of 2017. Um, and backers are just getting it well, as less like two, three months ago, you know, and... That, that's not even going to, you know, fly right now, right? So here is a story to it. And basically, they just had a bad run. They were first-timers, and they learned a lot. They took a lot of lumps. Um, they had to change some things. They learned a lot about, I think, a lot about game design and backer interaction and things like that. And at one time, I even canceled my pledge um, because of some of the things that went on during the campaign. But here's the deal. This game, the people behind it, did a complete, you know, they just flipped the whole thing on its lid and did the best they could to give to the backers what they asked for. And I feel like they delivered that. It's a little bit different than what they initially showed, but the heart of what they they, they created is there. And, uh, you know, that's why I think this game is a good game. But what you're basically doing is is um, you're trying to get to these, you know, different different locations and also the different icons in them you'll have some traps and barriers and as you enter a room and this is the cool part you're actually going to decide how you're going to enter the room and that will kind of like you're going to roll against that to determine like are you going to come in alert for other things that are going on are you going to just be bold and kind of ready and then are you going to be careless so if traps spring up they're going to affect your role and also how you approach enemies in that area so there's there's a little bit of you know, a little bit of that, too, that I like that's really different. Um, like I said, as long as you're fine with, you know, rolling for, rolling for this, rolling for that, you're going to be good to go here. Right, um, so let me – I'm, I'm yeah. glad you brought this up. I'm going to break down exactly – okay, so I have, I have two issues with the game. You just nailed one of them. So there's – I mean, we made the jokes about check, 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 lots of checks and everything, the dice rolling and everything. The, the, the part that I had, one part that I had a, the biggest trouble with is just that process of, okay, you've cleared out a card and now you're ready to go to another card. So now I, I can't just flip a card. I have to roll a check to see if I'm alert or careless or whatever it is. Okay, roll a D6. I roll the D6 and then I have a account bat in front of me. And then I have to roll to see if they're surprised. It's like, okay, there's a surprise round, you know, who gets like the first shot and everything. Yeah. And then not only do I have to roll a surprise round to see kind of what happens, now I'm in this like extra phase of combat where 
I can do a melee attack or I can do a range attack and you know or the range the range character I think goes first and they get to shoot and then because yeah. of the if the monster engages the archers in melee then they can't do their archer attack and it's like why am I what's going on here why can't I just <laughs> I, I made th- I made three separate levels of checks all with their own modifiers because there's a lot of modifiers plus two whatever you got yeah. and then now I get to do regular combat after this kind of this chunk of roles that I'm not really sure they even all needed to be there. You know, yeah. why not? Like, and I think that, you know, again, reading a blog, Kevin is tr- really trying hard with the game, like you mentioned before, always improving it, interact with the, with the backers. He's trying to say, okay, let's, I wanted a little bit more tactical depth, you know, with the art, with the me- melee and the range. Yeah. I just felt like, okay, fine for one, but it's happening a lot. And if you play the campaign, then maybe like, you know, th- depending on how many times you encounter a, a combat, maybe, you know, four or five times in a session, y- you just get into the roll, 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 roll. It just feels very cumbersome and you get that yeah. dice fatigue that sets in. And I'm wondering if it had to be that way. Yeah, I, I mean, like, it's it's so D&D-esque, um, but it does feel like you're rolling more. Yes. Um, oh yeah. You, you like roll. Yeah. Because <laughs> you you are you really are. So like if you come up on a, a certain encounters, you're gonna have to make a choice on a on a tier of like, hey, you know, fifteen. If I hit a certain number, I get this. You know, I get this opportunity. If I hit this, I get that. And then also you get a chance to use your stats to buff them. You like to buff to kind of help out with your rolls and you know like your base sets. Okay, all there. Love that. That's what we want. You know. You got that? That makes sense. Okay, so I can pass this trap or I can, you know, have this conversation with this elf or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. But, like, when you get in a combat, man, you are rolling for different levels. It makes sense. Okay, I got to roll for range. If I have range, I should get a kind of a combat advantage. Plus, I may be alert, so I need to roll for be alert. So I know that I get kind of the, the jump where I put an, an advantage uh, put advantage and disadvantage on people based on using, a, you know, flipping a certain skill or card or whatever. I like all of that. But you're right. Like... It's a lot it's of track. A lot. It's a lot it's of track. A lot to track of. And, I mean, as I got deeper and deeper in the planet, I got better at it. But I did realize, like, hey, man, you're like, you are rolling quite a bit. And until you have command of the rules, like, you're going to be really deep in that rule book, man. And that yeah. rule book, it's not great. That 56-page rule book, you mean? The big, fat rule book right. that has, like, indexes? It's, it's like, what's going on here? Like. And, and, and what I'll say is, like, you'll hear a, like, if you hear a lot of different reviews of this game, you'll hear a lot of rolling, a lot of rolling. It really is that particular phase of the game. Like, for the most part, I don't, I didn't mind it at all. And this goes into a positive where it's about 30% combat. So, you, you know, so, like, you know, you get an encounter, at least an encounter every single card. Um, but not every encounter is a monster. A lot of times you get these kind of random encounter type things. Yeah. And those can be really fun. And that, that's actually where my most positive aspect of the game is. Yeah. It definitely embraces that spirit of a lot of different wacky things can happen, especially as you get more sets and s- shuffling weirder stuff. So, like, you might meet, I think it was like a baby nymph or something. And it's like, this baby nymph is crying. How do you calm it down? <laughs> <laughs> you right. have to do like a right. party test, which is a kind of like this, or like a tiered test. You have to make multiple rolls in order to calm it down, and it's like kind of a push your luck. So it's like he's kind of calm. I can roll this d6. I can roll to make him really calm, or I can, if I fail the roll, then I'm gonna really cheese him off, and he's gonna cry more. <laughs> yeah, like I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this one accounting. Uh, this one card right here. I was just like, I was like, there's some couple cute ones in here. Like there's a water. Uh, this water, and he's like, hey. Um, he's in a human out of shape. He says, if you wish to pass, just sing me a lullaby. Yep, and then you got to the roll. You know, like, that's the one. Like, there's there's <laughs> stuff in there. That's the thing. There's a lot of cool stuff in this game. And and believe me, I'm only getting that out of the way because I really like this game a lot. Sure. Um, but, it, it, that like, the combat part, like I said, you're going to be kind of, your first couple of games, you may be, like, stuck in that rule book. Um, you're going to have a lot of decks to kind of sit down and sift through. But, like, once you get that organized, I mean, you're good to go because... It is a, you know, it's a good adventure. Um, that's, that's the cool part about it. It's like, it is, it's this adventure. is what I'll say. Like a, a lot of these adventure card games do not offer adventure. They shouldn't be yeah. called adventure card games. This right. one can honestly be called an adventure card game. Adventure. Right. That's, that's the best way to say it. It is a true adventure, not just cards. 
It's not just you know, combat. It's not right. just you know this this particular experience. It's not basically a, a big hand management puzzle, which some of these can right. be. Right. There is right. adventure. There's imagination. They tell stories. Does it is is the story weighed down by this rolling issue? For some people, it is, and yeah. I'm not gonna you know a skimp on that. For me. You know, I and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, I kind of skip some of those roles, like you know, because I really yeah. want to kind of go through the story. So, like, okay, uh, I'm not going to go in through surprise. I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. take an average and get through it. And yeah, and maybe that was just me kind of wanting to experience the story and everything. Um, but it just, I, I do, and also wanted to avoid that dice fatigue. But beyond that, there's a story there, and there's an experience there, and there's random stuff that happens, which is what I want adve- out of adventure. Uh, and yeah. actually, at this point, I'll, I'll just um, – I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jeremy. I just want to give my my second criticism of the game. You mentioned before about the symbols. There's a lot of symbols. And there's, there's yes. a lot of symbols. And it's going to take yeah. you a long time to kind of overcome the barrier of how much symbology there is to – it all makes sense. Like kind of once you really wrestle with it, you know, like, an, like a little barrel means, uh, you know, there's, there's like something hiding in there and you have to pull it from this deck. And it, it's just a lot. Of interactions, and then you'll have to kind of shuffle through a deck for like discoveries and loot and things like that, and you, you yeah. can spring up tracks along the way. So that's a thing. You're kind of burning through decks a lot sometimes for you know stuff, and that's strange too. You know, like it's it's strange, but I like it. Yeah. It's fine. You know, so I mean, and it's one definitely one of those things. Like for a fun adventure game, am I? Does it feel like homework? <laughs> <laughs> am i cross-referencing am i looking up on bgg and everything just to learn all the symbols that could be a difficult thing too um but it, it's one of those things where like i can th- those two things are not part they don't for me they don't damage the core and the core is that adventure the core is that 70 percent of cars that are in combat they're just the wondrous they're these wondrous encounters and they're whimsical and they're humorous and maybe or maybe they're just like you know you crawl across a, a ravine and that's not exactly an exciting card but i can kind of visualize that like and you can help each other I, we didn't even mention the cooperation there's actually a lot of different ways that to people cooperating so like if you have a guy that's good at climbing and you, he makes the climb check he might help another person that you know the schmuck back there who can't climb okay you succeed too like it's not huge but it's enough and it's it puts me in a good mental space it really does um, I, I for the most part despite my issues with it which are very clear and might be game breaker for some people for me i really liked it this game is really the beginning um mm-hmm. so they had two boxes here they had the you know the sweep the weeping caves and the Great Sewers. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't delved too much into the uh, Great Sewers, but man, I feel like they had like a better, more, better stuff going on in here. So I'm, I'm going to delve deeper into that, and I'll probably update you on that because I did not. But I, I played basically the Weeping Caves. Sure. And I will tell you that they have the opportunity to take this and really make it big. Like, they have an opportunity if they do it right if they come back and they they have like better writing uh you know they keep coming back with more robust mechanics they listen to what people are saying I, um even, even less the, mechanics yeah. like this would be better right. with less mechanics this would be better yeah. with less die well, rolls i don't need that surprise round like if they did if they smooth yeah. some of that out i think they could really have something so i'll be honest with you i kind of know a little bit I'm not going to tell everything. All I can tell you is, is that they, they do have some really big plans, and that they're going to come back to Kickstarter later on this year. Cool. I think they've they've really like uh, Kevin Young over there. He's he's really been paying attention to the feedback, especially the negative feedback. And instead of like you know tuck and tail, he's definitely like taking it on the chin. And I think uh, they come back with a big response because I'm I really like where this game is, and I think it is the beginning of something potentially that could cool. be big. Yeah. All right, so that was Legends Untold, uh, also Tiny Towns. We uh, threw in a couple of reviews. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for sharing your thoughts. We're going to conclude the game portion of our show. Uh, if that's what you tuned to ENGN for, then I'm very happy uh, to give you that. And, you know, you, we'll see you next week with another uh, very fun episode. We are going yep. to take a turn uh, to a little bit more of a personal chat. And, you know, I don't have any anything prepared. I, I know some general... 
um, you know, stuff about what goes on with Jeremy. But, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of eager myself because, you know, I barely scratched the surface here. And, you know, like I said uh, before, guys, I have been honest about my journey. Uh, and Jeremy has also has a little bit of a journey to share about himself. And, you know, we're going to try to keep it hopeful. But we're also going to, you know, quote, unquote, be real and honest as well. Um, so, my friend, um, you got you got a story. You know, one of the things I know about you is that you were in the armed services. And, yeah. you know, you got some other stuff going on. So, you know, actually, you know what? I the, When we, we were, were hanging out at PAX and you were mentioning before about, like, you know some people and you know some people that go through the armed services stuff. So I don't know if you want to talk about that one first or if you wanted to go somewhere else. Or I'm just, I'll throw the floor open to you. Oh, wow. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll kind of give you, like, just where I am, where I'm from. But, um sure. I, I hail from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I, uh, I was I was born and raised here, but I lived a little bit of everywhere across the United States, mostly here in the South, um, in the South region, uh, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, Arkansas, Alabama, uh, Atlanta, those types of places like that, um, Chicago and Ohio and things like that. So did a lot of that. I went to the military when I was 19. Uh, eight, sorry, I went to the month after I turned 18, and... Um, yeah, it was great. I was in the Marine Corps. I served there um, for two years, and I got hurt, and I came home. And uh, one of the things that I found out when I was in the Marine Corps was that I kind of had an anger problem, and I didn't know I did So, because I'm not a fighter, <laughs> and I'm not really a trash talker, but it kind of came out of me. And the reason why I'm saying that is because something I found out something else. So... Um, I came home, and when I came home, uh, one of the things about the military is, is you have a very tight brotherhood. And uh, I, I mean, when I say tight brotherhood, like after a while, you when people say civilians, they kind of get that into you when you're in the boot camp. But you kind of start saying that because you start to look at your your family, yourself as like us. And ride or die, the man. Ride or die. Right? Like, like our family. Like I mean, honestly, like I'm not like I'm really not playing. Like you civvies over there <laughs> like don't touch us like our family you know like not only my brothers but also their family members it's like we're us yeah. and uh you know when you come back home and that that that's not there every day uh everybody else is weird so um i came back home man and i really hit that depression i mean even hanging out with my friends i was just like i am not they don't they don't get it and I never saw, I never saw, I never shot a bullet at anybody, thankfully. You know, I had to because I don't know if it was really in my heart. Uh, But I know that the duty, you know, the sense of duty was. And I'm so glad I did that. But when I came home, man, that had hit me. And I kind of went to a very, very uh, deep depression. And uh, I actually didn't, like, know this right away. And then I realized this was in my family, depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, years later, um, things just, I was a teacher. And I'm, I'm a teacher. I, t- I actually train adults now, but I was teaching elementary school kids. And uh, I was kind of in a weird part of my career, but I eventually started to go back to counseling again. And I realized I was doing some pretty destructive things, uh, up and down, just doing all these kind of weird erratic things, highs and lows, spending uncontrollably, uh, uncontrollably making a, you know bad choices with my body and things that I was putting in it. And... Uh, I found out that I was bipolar. <laughs> mm. So so I realized this. You know, um, the one thing about me, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, because I actually did this for Kate's, uh, Kate's Corner, a blog I wrote about this, is that, like, I'm a very positive person. I'm a very energetic person. As I say, like, I'm the minister of good fun. Like, I can, you know, have a party with an idea that I saw on the back of a bottle cap. Like, I can literally... <laughs> have fun like starting from zero and at that time like I could I could go and not stop the party and then continue to not stop the party and as long as everybody was with me having the party they didn't care because we were all having a good time but at the end of the day you the party ends and then everybody has to go home and when I went home I was in the worst condition ever and uh, that's the part that people didn't see or the part where I didn't come around anymore at all like all of a sudden it was like where is this guy like it's because i didn't want to leave i didn't want to be around humans (laughs) and Mm -hmm. you know that that was another side of me and i'm so glad that i started to go to counseling for that 
And I always try to tell people, like, it's, it, you, you, it's hard. Uh, thankfully, I have a wonderful woman who's in that field that slowly over time it finally convinced me, thank God I met her, that, you know, that that was something I need to push myself towards because, we, you know, of with my past. But, you know, like, that let me know at least where I was, and I still had some hills to climb, and that's where we'll get to the gaming part. Uh, but like, without her, man, and without – like some of those turning points that could have ended my career, my future. Like, man, oh boy, man. I, I always tell people, like, take the risk. Talk to someone if you can. Now, yeah. I'm going to try- Actually, okay, if I can, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, just to talk about bipolar a little bit, because we have a lot of listeners who don't know what that is. Mm. It might be a little bit of a scary okay. term. So maybe you could share a little bit about what that is okay. for you. Okay, so bipolar is for me. So... There's, there's bipolar, I believe, one and two. And, like, I'm mild bipolar. So what this is is basically um, I – you you have – what's the best way to describe it? I'm going to kind of do some general things. Sure. But people who are bipolar have very high highs, okay? So there's really high spikes of energy, sometimes uh, energy that you, you don't realize you don't have. You're just kind of going with it. And uh, there may be some other symptoms of, like, impulsive things, like doing things that are very impulsive and risky, Um, promiscuity, um, you know, uses of drugs, um, you know, making choices, not necessarily making uh, conscious decisions all the time, like the best decisions, just making erratic decisions, Um, which this is the weirdest part is is that it's kind of my nature anyway Mm -hmm. uh, um, to kind of just... I, I like to take risks, you know, like I like to try things anyway. So picture someone trying to tell me that I had something going on with me when I'm like, hey, I'm just fun, you know, I'm fun or I'm just excited. But there's also like, let's let's take all that, that fun stuff out. Let's just talk about making random decisions during the day or being focused, you know, having a hard time focusing on certain things uh, because you're thinking about multiple things and trying to do a whole bunch of things at once um you know like it's one thing to be unorganized and have a couple windows open but it's another thing to be unorganized and have 15 20 windows open and you're trying to do a little bit of everything in each one of the windows in your computer because that's where your head is at it's a little bit everywhere and um yeah it, it can be quite a bit and like that that thing is followed by this other low which Sometimes the manic, the manic depression, that kind of man, they call it manic state in a sense. But then there's also that other side, which was usually where the depression kind of gets lumped into there sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like I'm not a doctor, but that's kind of what it is really for me because the other part is such a drastic drop off of of that depression, man, and it mounts up. You know, it it does it mounts up because you don't see it coming and it crashes. Yeah, you know, like obviously people know my background. I'm a psychotherapist and I deal with people with bipolar. And a lot of them, like, you know, you, you describe that manic state of like, you know, the riskiness and the, um, the, the like maybe like a heightened sense of confidence. You know, you're like, you just feel just, like you're on top of the that, world. I can do anything. So and, that's what I'm saying. The Superman complex. It's, I call yeah. it Superman complex. It's like you are you are the chicken hawk. I don't know if you know the cartoon, but, like, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. yeah, that makes me old. That makes me old. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Like, you really do feel like you can do anything. Like, I was a great athlete, but think of it like this: like I'm already cocky. My dad, you know, my dad gave me that, you know, that kind of swag. You know, picture that plus being good, plus having this un, you know, unreli- you know, this ridiculous content, uh, you know, confidence. Where I was playing college basketball, but I was a bench player. There was people who were clearly better than I was, but I thought I was a pro basketball player, and they weren't. Like, and I could do all these things that I couldn't do because it was just in there it was mentally in there and i took it too far you know like you you take it too far and that's the thing like it's so hard for people to um to accept that or even have the initial conversation of that yeah like they think you're weird they think you're just like you know crazy quote unquote or stupid or like delusional or whatever these stigmatizing words and meanwhile like there is brain chemical stuff that's happening in there that's causing some of this as evidenced by the fact that like in six hours you could just like turn yeah. and you're in the, you're in the pits again. You know, I can, I, I'm not bipolar. I'm, I have depression. I'm not bipolar. I can only imagine, you know, no, I'm man, I'm serious. Like you, the thing is, is like to go, 
I mean, I'll just cut the the personal, like the the personal side of it in a sense, like the personal, like life life side, and before we get to the gaming side of it, but like the personal side, like I always make sure I'm around a lot of you know my fellow brothers in combat, my brothers and, and ladies in combat, and we, you know, whenever I even see random people who are military folks, I always you know I jam them up because best thing about being in the military is you can actually get a little little up in people's face because we are used to that. <laughs> So when I see these people with their families or I talk to them, I'm like, hey, you know, you need to make sure you're getting taken care of, whether that's just for medical care overall, but also just make sure that you talk to somebody because I work for the VA and, like, we try to make sure people are getting these services and a lot of people don't get services because they never walk through the door. Now, whether you, how you care about the services of the VA, that's fine, but I'm just saying not just for you, for your family and we can help. And I'm especially in the counseling part because of so many military uh, brethren, you know, committing suicide and things like that. And it may not always have been prevented, but I've had instances where literally if I did not walk down a hallway just because I wanted to come say hi to random people, I actually may have stopped someone from killing themselves that day. And I am not a counselor. I'm just a guy who happens to like to talk to random people. So, Thankfully, I'm a guy that happens to take weird breaks during training and also walks down a hallway I shouldn't have been and likes to talk to random people that day, you know? And I just tell people, like, that's why it's so important to, you know, you know, man, just make sure people are getting counseling. And even if you're not in the military, man, make sure you just, you know, put in, like, do that. Do it. It's okay even just to talk to somebody, even if you, you know, you're going through anything or nothing at all. Just to have a voice, a different voice. Um but, I love how I love how you describe how um, like because you when you think of military you think of like you know the people who were in, I saw active combat and they saw all these crazy things. It's not just that though. Like anybody yeah. who is in there and now they don't have it. Like they even talk about you know anytime you retire from a sport or anytime you like into something and it's a brotherhood, it's a family, and then for whatever reason you don't have it anymore. And I yeah. imagine for the military it's like times ten. You know. You know what they call, uh, you know, when you go in the military and you, you, you call it washout or what they write in your paperwork, because I used to work in the benefits part, it's, you know, they'll call it like uh, when you get discharged right away. Some people get discharged right when they come to boot camp because they lied about something or whatever. Da, da, da. Yeah. They call it failure to adjust. And uh, it's interesting when you leave, you know, uh, I call it failure to adjust as well, you know, because you got to adjust back to all these people with different rules and, you know. Maybe you come back home after four years of the military and you're with these 22-year-olds and 19-year-olds and you're like, you have no idea what I've seen this <laughs> my entire four years here. You know, like, you have absolutely no idea what the world looks like or these and this and that. It's not even a high and mighty thing. It's just like you have just been, ex- you may have been just exposed to so many things that someone your age hasn't. And, like, that will make you, you know, push away everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, or when the rules reset you know, like even with your, you know, your spouse or someone that was with you, like when you're out, they may be more an adaptive to like trying to adapt to what you did, but now you're both out there and it's like, it's not the same, you know, it, it can cause a lot of different things and alcoholism and all these types of stuff. Um, but I want to, I want to go over to the gaming part. So let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. I was just saying that. So, it's like, okay, we need so, some games back in here. <laughs> okay. So this is the thing. So I come back into board games. Uh, I was like around, I want to say, 2015-ish. Um, um, my wife, my father-in-law passes, right? And, uh, you know, we get a, you know, a decent chunk of money. And I said, hey, you know, I really would like to get, um, you know, like she was like, well, you can do something, you know, whatever. And she was really kind to me. And she said, hey, I'm going to give you some money um, before we put all this stuff away and to get some clothes for work and da 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 And I said, I want to get back into board games. So I... Uh, Decided to kick up this hobby again, and you know, I went to that, and you know, I, I discovered Kickstarter. And like some people in this hobby, I did kind of exactly what everybody else does on Kickstarter. They start backing a lot of things, and mm-hmm. uh, one of the games we just talked about today, Legends Untold, is one of those. But um, and then I just started backing everything, and Kingdom Kingdom Death Monster, and Gloomhaven, and all these big box games. Uh, I, I just can't remember what they all were. Um, interesting enough, I kind of own most of those games. Uh, and yeah, I was backing things like crazy and buying all these games and charging things. And what I realized is like I was feeding into my mental illness. 
Wow. Like, I was feeding it. I mean, I was feeding it. Wow. And it felt so good. Like, it felt so good. The rush mm-hmm. felt so good. And I was on that high. And that's the thing. Like, if you're doing medication and stuff, that's great. That's fantastic. But you still have things you have to learn and limit. And you have to decide what's most important, you know, in the end. And that's part of what, you know, like, that's part of the rules of the game. You got to know, hey, like... I can't make these choices. I can't be up at all hours of the night drinking and making choices to buy games. You're feeding yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, part of that may not be disease. It may just be you making bad choices. But at the same point, you start to see the bills stack up. You start to see these things and you're compromising it. And I have a son, you know, and I had two homes at the time and things like that. And I started to make these choices. And I was like, oh, my God, it's happening. And I had to make some choices and apologize and Part of the thing was I had to go back to that old principle of, like, it's just stuff. So I was raised with that. It's just stuff. I grew up, we were very poor when I was very young, and then, like, my mom just did better. That slowly, slowly, slowly as I got older. But because of that, like, like when I first started playing board games, they were all donated to me. Mm -hmm. And, like, even toys. And my father's side of the family a little bit more well-off. You know, they would give me all the stuff at Christmas and stuff like that. So I really didn't have any value on things other than like, boy, this is cool. This is awesome. Toss it. Oh, this is cool. This is awesome. Toss it. Because I wasn't used to having everything all the time. And so that's kind of how I look at board games. And at first I was just in the rush, in the high. Sure. And yeah, and then eventually I had to say to myself, like, this is just cardboard and cubes and plastic, man. There's more to life than this. And I was deciding to make it my life. And now, even as a content creator, there's that, that thing of, like, reviews and review copies and the feeling of a rush of being popular all of a sudden, if you want to call it that. Like, I don't think I'm popular, but, like, you, 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 you get a rush. You start getting fed. You know, it's feeding into that, that super, Superman complex. Oh, it feels so good. And you have to really temper that. And sometimes when I don't, I melt down and I become very depressed and then i go away and for people who are fans of mine or even friends in the industry who are friends of mine it that's not good for them because they don't know what's going on with me. <laughs> and i'm very interactive and all of a sudden i'm not and mm-hmm. that's that, that's a drastic change and that's kind of what this is for me so even as a content creator as a buyer um as a friend of of you and 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 other people like you know, you have to realize what's all at play. I'm a family man, you know, and I'm a content creator, and I'm, you know, a friend to a lot of people. Like, if you care about that, then you also have to make better choices inside of your mind as well for you and for those people if you really care, and I do. So I, I really have to – I'm always going to be a work in process, uh, progress because this is not going to go away. You can't get rid of it. But what you can do is make better choices and and – control it as it comes um you know or like i said speak to a counselor and and maybe up your dosage dosages or try different medications because that's always going to be a work in process too as you get older um yeah i I mean i actually i'm like blown away by i i had no idea you were going to take the conversation that direction because usually when people talk about games like how games have helped yeah and they do help you know, like yeah. playing games socially or figuring out a puzzle or getting into the flow of something, it helps. I, I never really kind of thought about it in terms of, you know, the the hype, you yeah. know, because that's what we're talking about, right? Getting yeah. hype. Yeah. And that's what Kickstarters are all about. Kickstarters are all hype. Mm-hmm. And the Twitters and, and everything, and, you know, being at a convention, that's like, you know, like that's all Even fun. You know, it's 1. all fun and games, so someone get turned, right. so to speak. Right. Um, but in you know, it, it really is. It really is. is. I, you know, but now that you say it, and like you know, kind of putting two and two together, not just with you, but with other creators, it, I can see that. I can see kind of that darker side of you know this hobby. I'm not going to say this hobby is like bad or anything like that, but like th- oh. there is definitely traps. That yeah, you can fall into. You know, I, I, and I, I want to like put that on the table first. Because I think that's important now. Like even even surface level, it's just ego. Like it feeds your ego. Like to have things first, to 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 be a, experience things before other people. That's great. But like even for me, that goes deeper. I get to see stuff before anybody even knows about it. Like 
you don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I know when the game got signed. I saw the prototype before it got signed. You know, uh, you know, I play tested this. Uh, the designer asked me this question about this. I got to rule da, 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 like, you know, all that stuff. Thankfully, I'm 40 and it doesn't really get me off. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> like 26 year old Jeremy, I'd be like, let me tell you, bro. Like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like 40 year old Jeremy, like I'm so over that. Um, but yeah, there's even just the ego of that. That's a thing. But man, you know, like for me, you know, it's dicey because I know, you know, I know me like sometimes I do let it stack up and I like that high and I have to watch it, you know. Um, but the big one that I think is great, especially for someone, you know, with the depression and things like that. Um, when that came back in that 2015 time, like it was a really good, it was a hard time for us, but, um, you know, because my wife went through her stuff and then like, I was going through mine in my own way. Cause this man had a really big effect on me and I really did detach. And one of the ways that I had detached, I got to uh, a couple different dungeon callers and, uh, one of the biggest games that the biggest one that started that all was mage night and mm. mage night, um, much like a video game Fallout, like it just it, it has such a big connection with a time in my life. So like back when I was in my twenties and going through that that kind of weird, crazy, nebulous time, and not again, Fallout Three was that game. Like it was the game that centered me, and I could go into a wall of depression but play Fallout for an entire day. That was me with World of Warcraft. And I just went into the world, and I I became in that world, and and that was it. Like no nothing bothered me. Like nothing was. Nothing was an issue. Nothing bothered me. I was in the world of Fallout. Collected and bottle caps was fun enough for me to do for a day. And that was it. Mm -hmm. By the way, I still collect bottle caps for absolutely no reason. Anyway. Because <laughs> you have you don't have enough stuff in for your the house. apocalypse. It's for the apocalypse. Anyway. <laughs> so like Mage Knight was the same thing. You know, terrible rule book. Just absolutely atrocious rule book. I printed out like six different things for it. <laughs> just like arenas and all this stuff. Still barely understood. Sat down there four or five hours just to play through it once. Didn't even understand what was going on. And it, 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 but it gave me this focus um, that helped me. And that's the thing of like, you know, being by poet, you really want to have something that things that you focus on and put a lot of energy to to help you. Like it just helps. Um, and, and like games like uh, Kingdom Death Monster that take a lot of upkeep and you get to go deep into the world and kind of run with your fantasy a little bit. I mean, like, you can go all in. It is an all immersive thing. You got you got miniature painting. You got you know all this worlds you can create. You got all these decisions you can make, and you can do it all solo, by yourself. You know, control mm -hmm. a society that feeds in so much of what's going on inside of someone like myself that I could get consumed in it, and nothing gets hurt. Nothing you know things get dealt with, and thoughts get thought out, and and because I'm in and if the game is that good and that thematic it works and what I found out was is that I wasn't going to have the friends who like that kind of stuff um, my friends like video games but I, I just knew they weren't going to like that kind of stuff and I was always a board gamer sp sporadically and this I was like wow you can play these games solo like games like this like really hard ones like real difficult ones I'll find those first so then I started to find those first and then uh you know, and I just went deep into them. Like, I went to Dungeon Saga. So you could tell, like, I was really into, like, RPG. Yeah, I know. Right? Like, wow. I started out, like, very much, <laughs> like, very much that was all I was playing at the time. And then I started to get into, like, the worker placement stuff. So, like, I went to, like, The Gallerist and Viticulture and Snowdonia, um, like, the essentials in a sense. Like, those are kind of types of things. Heavy worker placement and... Then I found out about little car games, like button shy games that you can just have in your pocket all the time. And what it, what I found was is like it fed into everything I needed. Like I, I needed time to like when I'm winding down after work to, to mentally have something that would really help me wind down. You know, I could go to a bar, have a drink and be by myself instead of looking for the attention of everybody in the bar. Or, or being, you know, like getting wet, ready to get fed by everybody else's attention because I like that. That's me, but at the same time, I know that's that's me. It's something in there. Um, I can just play my little card game, have drinks, maybe talk a little crazy, and then get out of there. Versus 
going on the bar, doing that on a Tuesday, and then hanging out all night until 2.30 a.m. and then trying to explain that to my wife. You know, and that that's what board games have done to me. They really are a center of that, and it's become so much more in so many other ways, and I'm so thankful for everybody um, that even cares who, who, who I am. Um, but, man, you know, like board games, they, it's really been a... It's really been a saving grace, you know, and and I'm really thankful, you know, to Mr. Gadishek for 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 that, you know, and it, you know, long live him, you know, Mr. Gadishek. But you know, I'm really thankful to my wife for being supportive of me. She knows what, you know, I deal with, and she's very tolerant, but she's also very demanding that I don't consume myself, and she does the best she can at stopping me from doing it. Um, but it's also my choice, and I that's what I try to tell people: it's your choice if you are aware especially if you are aware of being medicated, it is your choice. Um, there's so many other outlets that you can do to help you. Mine is just board games. Could be working out. Could just be constantly, you know, counseling. Could be changes in diet. It could be a combination of everything. Um, but board games just happen to work for me. And I'm so glad that solo games exist because they help me when I'm in those dark places. And, you know, they are fun. It's not just for dark, dark purposes. But yeah. it's also... <laughs> It's also like the best thing for me because it feeds the other part, which is the part of me wanting to be around a lot of people and sometimes being the the center of attention and entertaining and being ha- like just that's me like it's me plus the amplified me of mm-hmm. like just enjoying this, just enjoying this like random people having fun. I invite anybody within my eye line. They gotta have great sight. I can see all of you come play with me you know like i want to make sure the person that's standing behind me trying to not be seen is seen and we have like interact and have fun i don't that's what i want but it feeds into me and that's fine you know because i'm in a constant process of controlling that but god man like i'm just more aware and i know there's people that are not that's what scares me so i mean first of all jeremy thank you so much for you know sharing your journey yeah. you know and, and, you know talking about all that stuff and like the gaming and like you know the pluses and the minuses and everything um you know i guess like the, the part that one of the parts that stuck with me is like you know just the people in the armed forces like i i, I help a lot of those folks yeah uh so and i know you're speaking to it from the inside and i mean if you have like a little bit of advice maybe for me or for people who want to help folks who are in the armed services or for people who were veterans themselves looking for help. I mean, if you have like kind of some words of wisdom or anything that you want to say, like particularly to that scenario. Okay. So um, just so you get an idea of, I work in the VA. I'm also in in employee development and I also work close to HR. So we're always constantly trying to find ways to develop training that is passed down nationally to let people know like how to do outreach and all different types of things that we do when people are within our walls. Um, but there are other programs outside of the VA that do that as well, that have outreach and places for people who are homeless and, and like outpatients and things like that. So I just want to let you know right now, there is an initiative right now for like outpatient care um, so that some people who cannot make it to facilities, like let's say you like live in L- uh, rural Arkansas, like my family's from Ar- uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and the nearest VA is like I think in Little Rock, which is like 60 miles away. But they do have outpatient clinics there, but they're not VA clinics. Well, now they have a program where you can go and seek, you know, like counseling and medical services where near where you are. Okay, so that's another thing. So I, I want to encourage that for people to look into that because yeah. that's a big bridge for people to climb, like because they can't get to a VA because they, you know, not everybody's from like the big city, you know, uh, and they can't drive there during the day. But you can get care where you're at. So if there's counselors where you're at or you need medical service, I want to make sure you know that now because that just started. And um, But also make sure you take a look at VA, just non-VA programs that usually have like vet centers. There's usually vet centers that are around. They are attached to the VA and they help people um, – find services and they kind of set you up and help you kind of get to the door um, but they're like not actually part of the VA they just work with the VA and I try to tell people to do that too um, or if you just want to be around your own people you know make sure you find one of these uh, the VA like people like so find like AGE like Disabled American Vets DAV and go hang out at one of their legion holes like they call it water holes or holes and basically, or posts, I'm just to say that, they got 
food, they got fish fries, all these types of things. But basically, they have veterans and their families eating together, talking, old folks down to the young ones. Because, of course, you may be from a generation of generations upon generations of military folks. Well, these mm-hmm. are this very diverse crowd there. You can sit and break bread with people and talk and change stories. And that may be all you need. You know, and then that begins a whole other life for you where you feel safe and then it can change into more that can affect your life. And I, especially for military folks, I think that's great. And even if you are a spouse and you're listening, man, woman or whatever, right, you know, maybe push them that way. Like take a look and see if they do have an American Legion are usually the one. American Legion is usually the one that has posts. You can definitely go to one of those. They always have good fish fry because they always got the right people cooking it up. <laughs> you know, oh, you, you, got, you can't even have people messing up that fish good, fry. Good, fr- good fried chicken or fish fry? They got, they got, usually got both. Go ahead, go over there. They'll hook you up, and then you also just have a good time, man. And I, 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 I really want people that are, are military folks to like, not feel like it's over when they left. It's not about money when you leave. It want to make sure you get care, and then get sure. care until the day you die. And when you die, the people that you leave behind are taken care of as well. But in order for that to happen, you gotta go now. Like you gotta go while you're alive so that you can live the best life you can for you and your family. And even if you just have a cat, your cat expects you to come home, okay? Like, you know, like it doesn't matter. That's why I tell I try to tell people that's a joke. But I try to tell them like even your cat expects you to come home. Like you gotta be with it, man. You know, like gotta be with it. You know, um, and you have a chance, even if you had a bad military life and things happen to you, um, you want to come out of the other side, man, and not make other people pay for it, you know, and I don't want that. I don't want that. And I don't want you to pop yourself off or hurt somebody else because of something that happened to you. You never talked about it. You know, get yeah. you in there, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the, the whole point of these personal chats, you know, to let people know, not only if you're a veteran, but like in, in all walks of life that, you know, the people who go through stuff, you're not the only one, you know, like, you know, someone out there loves you, even if it's just your cat, you know, someone out there absolutely loves you. There's someone out there resonates with you. Someone out there is going through maybe not the same thing because no one goes through the same thing, but something similar. And, you know, just don't be afraid. Reach out. I've, you know, had a couple of people reach out to me. I'm sure, Jeremy, you have people reach out to you all, all the time. Yeah. You know, maybe after the episode comes out, you know, um, if we wanted to hit up Jeremy, you know, it's very available. <laughs> He's very, very hard. Very available. But you get my, my email yeah. is Jamba, like Jamba Live, but it's Jamba PG. So it's Jamba PG at uh, gmail.com. I'm sure you can leave it in the notes or something like that. But I'm very yeah. readable to find it. My name is Jeremy Howard. You can go to the Jumbo Live Plays Games community, jumbolivplaysgames.com, all those places. You can find me. I'm always willing to talk to people. If you need to talk for a minute on the phone, I will do that if I have time permitting. I don't care, especially if you need help. You need help. I help people the best way I can, whenever I can, or I'll put you in the right direction. Because I also have to watch my mental space there, too. Because I get to save people, superhero complex, I can't do anything for everybody, but Mm -hmm. the best part about what I've learned as I've gotten older was, is to also be the person that knows where to pass things off to people that are better at what I do, that better than what me, because I do have knowledge, but I'm not the specialist, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So you have to do that, you know, that's that's, that's just life, (laughs) you know, but yeah, something I have Jeremy, you got a heart of gold. Uh, you know, you got a lot of bravery coming on here. You know, talking to, you know, uh, sharing about your story and everything. Uh, thank you so so much. I mean, I really hope that this, you know, like little chat that we've had helps helps people. Uh, you know, lets them know that there's other people out there that are going through what they're going through and have gotten through it. That's the that's the that's the message that you get through on the other side. Geese help, friends help, all this stuff helps. So thank you so much, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me, man. Any time. And you can get in touch with me at engine underscore podcast on the Twitter, every night's game night Facebook group, every night's game night dot com, uh, private geek mail on BG user Pope Sixtus. I have a geek list, a couple of geek lists, one for the every night's game night show, one for cooperative games. So please uh, reach out to me, uh, check out my geek list, check out my content, and uh, you know, I'm willing to obviously talk about anything. <laughs> Uh, not a lot of podcasts, um, you know, go in this direction. It can be a little bit difficult, a little bit overwhelming. 
Uh, but I think they're important. And obviously in my work as a psychotherapist, this is kind of my life. You know, um, I have to kind of watch myself. I don't want to kind of overindulge uh, these kind of conversations. I have to want like to be very, very cognizant that, you know, not everybody wants to enter into this space. You know, so any episode where there's a personal chat, there will always be some kind of like gaming piece so that people can come away from the episode at least with something. Um, and it don't, if they don't want to engage in the more difficult stuff, which is perfectly fine. Um, one thing I did want to put out there uh, before the end of the show is if you are a person, uh, especially if you're a content creator, if you're a quote unquote famous, <laughs> which none of us are famous. I mean, it's uh, as Jamie was saying, it's kind of it, it's kind of like an ego puff to even call yourself famous like that. Um, but if you're a person like on a dice tower or anybody who kind of puts content out there. And you feel like you, you have something to say, but you don't quite have um, a good outlet for it. Um, you know, this is what I do. And at this point, I hope that I've kind of put out a model for how people can kind of share, you know, their experiences, share what they got to say um, as a way of just, you know, you know what? I'm tired of being fake. I'm tired of you know, the positive stuff and yeah, positivity is great, but there's that other side of life as well. Uh, you know, sometimes people just want to like put it out there and get it over with and just move on with their lives and get it off their chest. Um, this is a format, you know, I'm willing to, to, to have a conversation. I'm willing to um, construct as safe a space as possible. Um, so I'm putting out the call, you know, uh, please let me know if that's something that people would be interested in, uh, highly anticipate that I will get no takers because <laughs> this is very difficult, but Hey, you know, uh, if I get one taker and I make one person feel better, then it's all worth it. So, um, that's about it for me. Uh, oh yeah. Go give us a rating on, uh, <laughs> iTunes. Yeah. I should probably ask for that every single time. Uh, so there you go. I've asked for my rating. So until next time, grab a game off of that shelf and let's make every night. The game ends.